Good morning. This is Prophet Six, Family Prophet to the Angel of the Church, to the Laodiceans. God bless you. Happy Sabbath. And the lesson that we're going to be studying today is Lesson 13. And the title of the lesson is called The Promised Revival, God's Mission Completed. <clears throat> so in this lesson, they're comparing um, revival with the completion and the spread of the gospel in the world. Uh, let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for another Sabbath morning. Father in heaven, we ask that as as I, I ask, as, as I as a living prophet, Lord, sits and takes time to go through this lesson, that Lord, that that Holy Spirit the spirit that you said that you was going to send and will convict the men, convict men of sin, judgment, and of righteousness. We ask, Lord, that you will fill me with wisdom of that spirit as we teach this lesson. And yes, Lord, I underscore judgment, which is one of the works of the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, as we delve into this lesson, Lord, I ask, Lord, that you will give me that inspiration that will open eyes and shut other eyes because they're not willing to see and they're not converted. They don't even want God. So, Lord, I pray this on behalf of the viewing audience. And, Lord, I, but I pray that those that see, they really see and they grab hold and not let go what they see and what they hear and what they understand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Matthew, I mean, lesson chapter 13, lesson 13. Promise revival. God's mission completed. Let me say something. You know, I was looking at some statistics. I was, I, I didn't do a thorough search, but I'm just going to throw this out here. I really don't have any statistical data to back this up. But it's like it's it is really common sense. Christianity is not growing at a rate that's overcoming the growth of the world's population. It is just not. No religion is. No religion is that aggressive. Be it the Baha'i religion, be it uh, be it Muslims, be it Christians, be it Catholics. And some people would say, why are you die? But anyway, whatever. Hey, hey y'all, we're not. And, and I really got a really interesting example of what's, what God sees what is happening in Christianity, particular, whether you, whether you include or exclude the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox. I got a really good explanation for what is how God really sees that as a living prophet. I, I'm, I'm, and I'm going to tell you. Now, the memory uh, text is, therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruits of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now, that's our memory text. James 5, 7 and 8, 9. 7 and 8, pardon me. Excuse me, yeah. Just woke up not too long ago. Uh, the challenge of preaching the gospel. Well, let's look at some of these texts here. In Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. We read. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Ghost and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In James 5, 7 and 8. Well, we just read that. And let's look at Zechariah chapter 10, verse 1. Ask ye the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So the Lord shall make bright clouds, bright clouds. I'm underscoring that. Put it in brackets. And so the Lord make bright clouds to give them showers of rain to every one grass of the field. And Matthew chapter 3, 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. And in Revelation 18, 1, and after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. So these are some of the texts. There's one more, but I'm not going to go through that one. In Revelation, oh, excuse me. Oh, uh, Revelation 19, 6 to 11 through 16. But let's forge ahead. <laughs> but but let, me, let me underscore this first. The first text that they mention in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, which they are going to study and cover in the lesson, I was, I, I, I got to tell you what church I was in, what state I was in, who the pastor was, and what's, I got to tell you all that. Uh, I was at this church called Emmanuel, Seventh-day Adventist Church, located in, what was that, is that Riverdale? Chicago Heights. Chicago Heights, yeah, it's Chicago Heights, Illinois. And the pastor's name there is J.D. Parker. Okay. And we were studying this scripture. Matthew chapter 28, 18, 20. And, and I'm going to say something to you guys. This guy is just an example of how the vast majority of pastors, if not all, think that this scripture should be interpreted. Now, I had told him that I had baptized like six people one year. And we were studying this scripture. So when they came to the scripture in the Sabbath school lesson, I raised my hand. I said, yeah, I they asked for testimonies. I said, yeah, I baptized six people this summer. Well, later on, the pastor came to me and told me, you're not supposed to be doing that. Oh, no. Let, let me show you how. No. we. And so the Sabbath school class started and I brought this scripture up. And. I asked them pointedly, you got to you got to narrow them down. You got to stop all the, the running around in the, in the circle talk. And I said, so you're saying who's who's supposed to be teaching all nation? And they said, we. And then I said, who's supposed to be baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy? They, they said, we. And I said, so I can do that, too. Right. They said, no. <laughs> Hey, y'all, uh, I'm not singling out him. I'm using him as an example and I'm putting his name out there because these pastors, for some reason, you can't, you know, touch not God's anointed and do these guys. Please, they're not anointed. They're not prophets. In the first place. So he told me that I'm not supposed to baptize anybody. The only people that's supposed to baptize is the pastor. Well, let's read that scripture again, because we don't believe the word of God. And Jesus came. Now, they love to say that everybody in the church is disciples. You, you guys familiar with that? 
Have you guys noticed? They love to say everybody is a disciple. Everybody is a minister. But when it really get down to it and you actually start baptizing people, they are abhorred if you don't bring them to them to baptize them, to catechize them. They are abhorred by that. But Jesus said, see, we don't really believe Jesus in Christianity. We really don't. Why is it in most denominations the only person that baptizes people is the pastor? That's like stupid. That means the rest of y'all not disciples because this is what disciples are supposed to do. It don't say just pastors. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. All power is given to who? Jesus. Not the pastor, y'all. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. This is the love of God. That's how I'm defining love. That we keep his commandments. This is the love of God. And why do you have oceans of Christians that have never baptized one single person. You can go and in, that's how you know all these denominations are the same. You go into these denominations, and no matter which one you go to, Seventh-day Adventist, Baptist, Pentecostal, Lutheran, blah, 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 whatever. The vast majority of the laity have never even thought about baptizing anybody. Wow. Wow. I wonder wh why do all of them think the same way? Because they all got the same teacher. His name is Satan. His name is Satan. Now, they don't agree on nothing else. Uh, and I'm going to tell you something. I am dumbfounded. When I look at the similarities of all these denominations, I'm amazed. We look at the differences, but I always highlight the similarities. And it shows that they are just clones with different talents and different preferences. Some of them say they speak in the Holy Ghost. Some of them say they keep the Sabbath. Some of them say they keep the feast days. Some of them say they Catholic. Some of them say they Mormons. They clones, y'all. They all clones. And if you had 10 clones, 10 clones would like, they would have abilities and preferences in different areas. They really are clones, though. They... And they all, and in a way, they are kind of clones, even in their thinking. Wh who gave all these denominations, the laity in these denominations, and the leadership in these denominations, a memo from heaven saying only pastors are the main people that should baptize, or the the people that the pastors authorize? Who who? Who, who passed out that memo? What angel passed out that memo from heaven? Disciples should be baptizing people. But I'm going to show you something. Here's a twist. Here's a twist. Watch out. Everybody in the church cannot be a disciple. That's one reason why most Christians are never baptized. You know, Christians don't even baptize their own children. They delegate and regulate that to the pastors or the elders. 
Why can't you baptize your own kids? Why can't you baptize your wife? That's stupid. The Bible says a man who can't take care of his own house is worse than a heathen. If you're a disciple, you should be baptizing your kids. You should be the main Bible teacher of your children and your wife. The Bible says, husband, love your wife if even, as Christ has loved the church and gave himself for it. You are a savior to your wife. That you might cleanse her by the washing of the water by the word. You are a savior to your family, husbands. You are, God has made you a savior to your wife. But that's not what the church teaching. No matter what denomination you go to, no, the vast majority of their laity don't baptize. That's how you know all these religions and these denominations are apostate in spirit and nature. You go to a church and only the only person that's ever baptized a person is the pastor. I don't even understand that. I never understood. So, so I was at this uh, Ephesus Seventh Day Adventist Church in Chicago Heights, Illinois. Pastor J D Parker. Oh, Emmanuel. It's Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Pardon me. Seventh day Adventist Church. And you know what? Most of the people in that congregation, they ain't never baptized nobody. If they not an elder or a pastor. Never. But look what the scriptures say. All power is given unto me. I'm telling you. Uh, these denominations are just another version of the Catholic Church. They really are. We're the voice of God on earth. You can't do it without our authorization and all this. What are you talking about? Who set up these type of habiliments? But anyway, let's forge ahead. So this is one of the top, this is another top false doctrine in every single denomination, every single major one, definitely denomination on earth today. This is another false, and matter of fact, well, this is a unspoken. They don't really teach and preach on this. It's a, it's a tacit doctrine. It's like, a, a, it's a, but if you bring it up, it'll cause an uproar. And if you start going there every week saying that you baptize this person and that person and you keep updating them when they ask for testimony, oh, Lord, it's going to like, what are you, they're going to be asking questions like, what are you baptizing these people into? I'm baptizing them into Jesus. They really expecting you to say, I'm baptizing them in the denomination where well, you're not authorized to do that. I'm baptizing them into the kingdom. Oh, they don't like that. First of all, none of these, uh, another false doctrine that may, they really, they give lip service to the kingdom. They don't know what it is. They don't believe in preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Because that's what they're going to come into. Jesus said you can't even see the kingdom of God if you're not born again. Y'all see, y'all see a pattern here? All these denominations fighting each other over small doctrine. And now the ecumenical movement is so strong in every major denomination. It's they're telling on themselves, proving that they're nothing but clones. Sisters of the harlot mother. That's all they are. Come on, y'all. Let's go ahead. The challenge of preaching the gospel in in context of the three angels' message to the entire world may seem impossible. Although the Seventh-day Adventist church is growing rapidly, it is not keeping up with the population. Mm, I wonder why that is. 
Maybe it's because you don't have the Holy Ghost. Hmm? Maybe it's because you don't have the ever living, living spirit of prophecy. Oh, you got books. Nobody didn't say you didn't have books, but you don't have the ever living spirit of prophecy because that's what brought about. That was the main instrument that God used and utilized in the outpouring of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. Notice that no books were used on the day of Pentecost. You, you, know, you notice that? Hmm? No books that are called the spirit of prophecy were used on the day of Pentecost? No, 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 no. What was used on the day of Pentecost was human beings that were inspired by God. And none of them were tares. Okay, get, let me give you a definition of tares. Tares are demons in the form of humans calling themselves Christians. That's what tares are. I, I want to give you a stripped down definition of some of these terms that are used in the Bible. Bare bone, flat footed. That's what tares are. Do you realize now? Now, although the Seventh-day Adventist church is growing rapidly, guess what it's growing rapidly with? Tears, y'all. Tears in the form of humans. How do I? Demons in the form of humans. Let's get strong here. I know you shuddering and saying, oh, you judgmental and all this. Shh, be quiet. Shh. Just, just settle down. You finally learning something. Tares are demons in the form of humans. How do I know that? Because Jesus said to the Pharisees, the general conference of that day, you travel all over the world to make one proselyte. And when you get overseas, all you do is make them double. You make them supersize the demon that you are. That's what Jesus said about the Seventh-day Adventist church today and in the past. Why do I say that? Because he said, that which hath been done shall be done, and that which, that which, should, oh boy, Ecclesiastes 1.9, anyway. Ecclesiastes 3.15, those are the two scriptures, okay? That which hath been is now, that which is to be have already been, and God requireth that which is past. The devil can't work in any new way. He can't, he's restricted. He has to work in the same old type of way that he worked in the past. God said, I'm not going to work anything else new either. That which hath been is now, that which is to be is already been, and God requireth that which is past. So he's not going to work in a new way to save us, to deliver us. It's going to be the same way he's done it in the past. So we have nothing to fear for the, the future, except we forget how the Lord has led us in the past and we have nothing to fear for the future except we forget how Satan has deceived us in the past. So, this rapid growth that they're talking about right here, although the Seventh-day Adventist church is rapidly growing, it is not keeping up with the population because the, the vast majority of this rapid growth are demons. That's all they are. You know how I know? Because the leadership that brings them in, Jesus said, they travel land and sea to make one proselyte. And when they reach him, they make him supersize the demon that they are. Jesus told these same guys, ye are of your father, the devil. This doesn't just apply to the Seventh-day Adventist denomination that applies to the Pentecostal, Baptist, Lutheran, Catholic, Mormons, whatever. They all doing the same thing. They filling up, they're evangelizing for Satan, but they're doing it in the name of Jesus Christ. And the reason why God has not given them power to evangelize the world, hastening the coming of, of the Lord is because they are tares. Demons in the form of human beings working for Satan in Jesus' name. That's what they are. So they never gonna spread this 
counterfeit gospel all over. Never, not one, even if they all got together, they would never be able to spread that counterfeit gospel all over the world. They, they never would be able to do it. It's not a God. Now, because now this is interesting that they make this observation. Although the Seventh-day Adventist church is growing rapidly. Yeah, it's growing rapidly with demons. It is not keeping up with the population. I wonder why. Because the power of God is not on your side. And this is a false revival. This rapid growth thing. It's a false revival anyway. The false revival always got to come before the truth. Always. There are multiple areas of the world where the name Seven Day Adventist, much less our message, is known. Now, look at their focus, y'all. Look. They don't say, look what they don't say. They don't say this. There are multiple areas in the world where the name of Jesus has never been heard. They don't say that. No, no, no. It's not the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the gospel of the kingdom. No, it's the gospel of the Seventh-day Adventists, Pharisees, and Sadducees. Look what they told on themselves right there, y'all. There are multiple areas of the world where the name Seventh-day Adventist, much less our message, is known. Wow. It's not about Jesus. It's not about Jesus. It's about getting your personal brand out there. Wow. I can't believe they just posted this. <laughs> they wrote that in here. <laughs> That's bold. That's in plain sight. And how many Sabbath school classes on Sabbath going to go read this and go right over it? Or they go, they'll know it, they'll acknowledge it, but they're going to poo-poo it. They're going to downplay it. Ah, oh, well, you know, that's no big deal. You can't make Didn't Jesus say if I be, oh, Lord have mercy. Oh, Jesus. Didn't Jesus say if I I be lifted up. I'll draw all men unto Seventh-day Adventists. No, no, no. He said, if I be lifted up, oh, 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 I will draw all men unto me. Look what they're trying to draw men into. The Seventh-day Adventist church. Wow, the devil is crafted. at. The reality of this harsh fact leads to serious questions. Now, the way that they just written, wrote this sentence, this is like pause for alarm. Nobody, they don't know about the seven day Adventist. Wait a minute, this is serious and harsh facts. <laughs> Not, they don't know about Jesus and his kingdom. Oh, this is serious. No, they don't, no, no, no. Baptists think the same way, the, the Lutherans think the same way, the Catholics think the same way, they're all clones in this regard. They're all working for the same cause by another name, the cause of Satan. Is it possible for the gospel to be preached to the, see, they, they, look at this, y'all, look at this. This is, oh, wow, God, thank you, Holy Ghost. Oh, Jesus. Look at this, y'all. <laughs> oh, Lord, have mercy. The devil is activated. Look, y'all, look what they're saying here. In the previous paragraph, you don't read nothing about the, look at this, the challenge of preaching the gospel in the context of the three angels' message. What about the, the challenge of preaching the kingdom? They don't believe in the kingdom. They believe the gospel is the three angels' message only. The challenge of preaching the gospel in the context of the three angels' message to the entire world may seem impossible. Well, as far as God is concerned, it is impossible. He says, seek first only the kingdom. He said, and seek first means seek exclusively the kingdom. 
Don't look for nothing else. And all those other things, three angels message, health message, that, that'll be added to you. Message to the entire world may seem impossible. Although the Seventh-day Adventist church is rapidly growing, it is not keeping up with the population. There are multiple areas of the world where the name, wow, instead of putting the name of Jesus, they put the name Seventh-day Adventist. Much less our message is not known. Woo, that's bold. That's bold. Satan getting bold. Wow. The reality of this harsh fact leads to serious questions. It is, po is it possible for the gospel to be preached in the entire world in this generation? Some of y'all, you don't know what in the world I'm talking about. You might as well turn this video off. Just turn it off and go, to, go surf the net. <laughs> but somebody can listen, is listening to the Holy Spirit speaking through me. And you see the context of what I'm talking about. You understand the nuance. They're actually in here redefining the gospel. They have redefined the gospel. Didn't Paul say, if anybody come preaching another gospel to you, they are cursed? They think it's about getting the name seven dead minutes out there. Woo! And they're going to try to get it out there. You know how? You know how Satan wants to get something else out there? He's going to do it in Jesus' name. Woo! And call it the gospel. Some of y'all just see that I'm just straining at gnats and swallowing the camel. But others of you see that I'm dead on point. It's like this brother owning something here. Why would they put seven day Adventists in place of the name of Jesus? The place where they should put the name Jesus or, or the gospel of the kingdom. Why would they put seven day Adventists? It ain't going to be no seven day Adventists in heaven. It ain't going to be no seven day Adventists denomination in heaven. None. But that's what they have here. The kingdom of God is going to last forever. Jesus is. And it will reign forever. Wow, this is some bold stuff. Heresy, right in the Sabbath school lesson. And everybody going to poo-poo it, you know, because they seven-day Adventists. But see, I do not care. The challenge of preaching the gospel. Okay, well, let's go back. It's hard to get off of this. Uh, <laughs> will there be some unusual breakthrough that will dim dramatically speed up the proclamation of the three angels' message. The three angels' message is a component of the gospel of the kingdom, not the other way around, people. There is always one thing. All these denominations, they always do this, with they, whatever they push it. There's always one thing to keep in mind when we discuss this topic. The mission is God's and he will accomplish it. At the same time, however, we must remember that we have been called to a crucial role in the final work as well. God, But when he says we have been called, God has not called the tares to do nothing in the completion of the gospel. He has not called them to do anything. Let's go to Sunday's lesson. The promised power. Christ's great commission, Matthew 28, 18, 20, is accompanied by the great promise. What is the promise? What does it mean in a practical sense? And how can we draw comfort from it? Why is that promise so important to us? The disciples preach not in their own strength, but in Christ. And another thing, people, they, they, they not going to mention this in the whole lesson. In order to have an outpouring of the Holy Ghost, you're going to have to have apostles and prophets. I don't care what people say. You're going to have to have living apostles and living prophets. 
So don't don't t- talk to me about no outpouring of the Holy Ghost and latter rain and all this stuff, and you don't believe that. Just shh, shh, be quiet. That's how it happened the first time. That's how it's got to happen the second time. The, the Bible in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 10 through 14 says it. We can't come into the unity of the bond of the faith until we have living apostles and prophets. And, and matter of fact, I'm going to even add this on there. Since I'm in the Holy Ghost right now, and I'm getting a download from heaven. You can't even have a second upper room experience if there's no living apostles and living prophets in one place on one accord. Hello. These things were written for in samples and were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world come. It's not about having Pharisees and Sadducees in one place and in one room and you think they out. Come on. When you get those, when you get the, those type of people in one room, what you're gonna have is something like a Rwanda. That's what you're gonna have: an outpouring of the unholy ghost. People are gonna be getting killed and slaughtered, just like happened in Rwanda. By the way, a 99% Christian country, Seventh Day Adventists, Baptists, Pentecostals, Lutherans. Catholics, they, they all killed their own members. The leadership of those churches all killed their own members in 1994. That's called the outpouring of the unholy ghost. They, they killed more people in one day in each denomination than the disciples baptized in one day. Hello. Over 10,000 people a day were getting killed. Woo. The most efficient genocide in the history of the world. The most efficient genocide ever recorded in the history of the world. And Seventh Day Adventists got their palm prints and footprints all over it with blood. That's what you're going to have when you get all these denominations together. A Rwanda. That's the only type of outpouring that they can have is an outpouring of the unholy ghost. Where you get all this information from? It's right on the news. They didn't do no mission. They didn't do no Sabbath school mission report study on that, did they? Mm-mm. Eliza Fan, Nataki Runamana, he was the president of the Afro-Asiatic Conference. He's the one that pushed the button and ordered and set his members and pastors up and had him killed. Hmm. And then when he when he finished his bloody deed, guess where he runs to to hide? The United States. He ran to the Adventists in the United States of America. I believe in the state of Texas. It didn't matter what state he would have ran to. All these churches are the same, y'all. I don't know why y'all don't want to believe it. They all the same. Hey, y'all, the point is you got to have living prophets and living apostles, not seminary students. <laughs> okay? <laughs> seminary students that paid to go to a college should pay to be a pastor no that's not no outpouring of the holy ghost that's satan trying to undermine the work of god in an outpouring of the holy ghost but y'all don't think satan is this serious do you you don't think satan is this serious do you mm-hmm. that's your problem so you still playing cards with Satan. You're going to lose every time. The deck is stacked in his favor. <sighs> okay. No matter how challenging the task, the promise... Did I read all this? Okay. It changed the world. Christ... Okay. Oh, let's go back a little. Although some might question the precise meaning of... Let's go back. The disciples preached not in their own strength, but in Christ. Well, first of all, they were converted. 
Come on. They wasn't just acting converted. They were converted. Pharisees always, they're, they're, they're hypocrites because they are actors. According to Paul, in fact, the gospel was preached to every creature under heaven in just a few short years. Although some might question the precise meaning of Paul's word, it is undeniable that the gospel made a powerful impact on first century society. Well, I don't believe that it went to every creature, but, you know, that this is supposed to be an in-house Christian debate on what he really meant by when he said every creature. OK, but we I get the point, you know, you know, we don't need to strain at that. But anyway, and it changed the world. Now, that's one thing we know that it did do. It did change the world. Christ promised his disciples that he would send the promise of the father and they will receive power from on high. The savior added. Who did he say was going to receive power on high apostles and prophets? All the apostles were also prophets, y'all. All of them. The Savior added, but ye shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come to you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the world. Now, let me unpack this for you. This Acts 1.8. You shall be witness of me in Jerusalem. That's the city. Judea. That's the country the city is in. Samaria. These are outlining areas. Okay. And then it says the last place, the last place, not the only place, y'all. The last place you're supposed to spread the gospel is to the whole world. Now, far as I can see. The church, Christianity has never received the gospel of the kingdom. Never. But guess what they are trying to do? And Satan, you notice that Satan always do things backwards? He always do it. How many people, who do you know is trying to convert the Baptist church, the Pentecostal church, the Seventh-day Adventist church? Who, who is, who, whose target audience are those three? Or the Catholics or the, or the Mormons? Who, who, who trying to do that? Come on, y'all. But Jesus said, ye shall be witnesses first. The first place, the first, not the only, not the only. I said the first place is going to be in the church. Uh-oh. Ain't that the place where he went first? He said, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What did he tell his disciples before he sent them? Go ye into all the world. Before he said that, what did he say? Go not in the way of the Gentiles in any city, Samaria, into ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Christians don't believe this part of the Bible. That's how you know we're doing the work of Satan. We don't want to do things the way that God commands us to do. This is the love of God that we keep. His commandments. Where you go, I'm going to go. Where you say, don't go, don't go. When you say when to go, that's when I'm going to go. I'm not going to preempt your commandments. Christianity is drunk with this. Every single denomination. That's why you got, you can go to any denomination and you can find the, you can find 90% of the congregation never has baptized anybody. Because they do things opposite. Satan always do things opposite, y'all. It changed the world. Christ promised his disciples that he would send the promise of my father. And he would receive power from on high. The Savior added, but ye shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witness of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the utmost parts of the earth. No matter how challenging the task, the promise of God are sure. Now, so the fact that the Seventh-day Adventist church has been around, I don't know, for 160 years, give or take, it means it don't have the Holy Ghost. I, I'm just doing simple thinking, y'all. I'm not making this complex and all this. I don't care who was a member of their church. I don't care how much truth they think they had. The Jews had a whole bunch of truth. 
They didn't have a Holy Ghost. They could. The, the Jews had the, a, a whole bunch of truth. Because, but could they save the world? Come on, y'all. Jesus told a woman at the well, he said, the, uh, what did he say? He said, uh, the salvation is of the Jews. That's what he said. Salvation is of the Jews, but the Jews wasn't ready to save nobody. Jesus said they travel land to sea and make people too more for the child of hell. They, as a nation, they were not ready to save anybody. As a denomination, they were not ready to save one soul. Just like Christianity today. Just like Seventh-day Adventism today. As a denomination, Adventists are, Adventism is not prepared to, to sustain and nourish those that are weak. They are not. Not as a denomination. They can't even do it. Okay, let's go ahead. How you going? How you going to sustain wheat and all ninety ninety nine percent of Seventh Day Adventists send their children to public schools to be taught by the Caesar in his compulsory public school educational system? Come on, y'all! Every denomination does this. That's how you know we're clones. I'm trying to make this simple, y'all. I saw angels. Let's read on. I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven, descending to earth and ascending to heaven, prepared for the fulfillment of some important event. Then I saw another mighty angel commissioned to descend to the earth to unite his voice with the third angel and give power and force to his message. Great power and glory were imparted to the angel. And as he descended, the earth was lightened with his glory. The light which attended this angel penetrated everywhere. God is not going to allow the current Seventh-day Adventists, Baptist, Pentecostal, Lutheran, and Catholic manage to penetrate everywhere. He's not going to allow it. Is he? Has it been done? Well, he's not going to allow it, y'all. It's spurious. It'll never spread. It's a, it's a counterfeit everything they profess to be preaching, just like the Jews of old in Jesus' day. And let me say this, this angel, I had a, I had a friend come to my house and he told me he never seen a place in the, he said, he don't, he, he, there's no place in the Bible where an angel represents people. Well, that don't make sense to me <laughs> that I'm like, uh, just a cursory examination of scripture will let you know that, that there is examples of that. You want an example? Revelation chapter one, verse 20. That, that, that's the end of the discussion. I don't really have to show another scripture. Revelation chapter 1 verse 20. It says the angel of the church. It says the seven stars are the angels of the church. And the angels of the church in that instance, if you read, they represent the leadership of the church. If you don't believe me, read Revelation chapter 2 verse 1 and 2. It says that Paul wrote a letter and he gave it to the angel of the church of Ephesus. This couldn't have been a celestial angel. It had to be what I call a terrestrial angel. It was a pastor, the leadership, the presbyterus of that day. That's who he gave. He wouldn't send a letter to heaven and put it in the mailbox. Do that make sense to you? Otherwise, you got to say, well, it was a spiritual letter. So now you're trying to tell me that he was praying to an angel. I don't think I don't believe that. That's a hard one to swallow. Look at this, people. Angels are messengers. They could be from heaven or they could be on earth. Prophets, preachers, evangelists, teachers, pastors. They are supposed to be angels of God on earth. So I saw angels hurry to and fro. Okay, I read that. God will finish his work. But he's not going to finish the work through Satan's people. I'm glad they said that in this lesson. 
God is not going to finish the work with tears involved. No, he says they get bound in bundles and they are totally separated and cut off from the wheat. God will finish his work and the reapers are the angels. Whenever you mention the parable of the wheat and tares, Satan's people always say, let them grow together. Meaning, meaning this. Now, the scripture do say let them grow together. But what it does not mean is this. Let them grow together and the more tares you find, bring them in also. It don't mean that, y'all. But that's how all these churches are interpreting that scripture. Let them grow together means yeah, find as many devils as you can get. Bring them in the church and let them grow together. No, no, no. It's saying the ones that's already there, let them grow together. If they are not in open sin. Ain't heard that twist before, have you? If you don't believe me, look at what Paul said. He said that wicked one put him out of the church that his body might be, his flesh may be destroyed, but that his, body, his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, if tares are not in open sin, let them grow together. But don't go around looking for tares through evangelism. You, pro, you, you travel land and see to make one proselyte and when you reach him, you make him twofold. Don't, no, he's not advocating that. That's how people interpret this scripture. Because when you look at the composition of all these denominations, they are filled with demons in the form of humans in nice suits and dresses and Sabbath frock and Sunday frock. God will finish his work. He will pour out his spirit in mighty power. Now look at this. If there's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, wouldn't you think that they would have to be an outpouring of the unholy spirit? Who's preaching about the outpouring of the unholy spirit? And beware. I've never heard anybody talk about the unholy spirit. I'm not saying it's never been talked about, but I've never heard it. Except for my mouth. And the reason why I'm bringing this up, that shows how much it's little known of. What are the ways that you can, in your immediate sphere, be a more effective witness for the Lord? That is, what can you do to help see the fulfillment of Matthew chapter 24, verse 14? And this gospel of the kingdom. Well, no, who's preaching the gospel of the kingdom, really? This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Because they're interpreting this scripture as, yeah, let's travel land and sea and do worldwide missionary work and bring in more of Satan's people. Because we don't, the only type of people we can bring in is Satan's people because we belong to him. Now, they don't consciously say this. But when you look at this objectively, this is what you can see. If you can see. Now, a lot of y'all, you love your pastor so much, there's no way that he could be a worker of Satan. No matter what he do, no matter how many women he get pregnant, no matter how much money he steal, no matter how many how much dope he sell, banks he robs, how many no matter how many boys he molest, he's the great man of God. Touch not God as anointed. Never see the man repent like David did. Never. But you still believe he's the great man of God. Mm -hmm. You're one of Satan's helpers. You just don't know it yet. But anyway, God will finish his work. He will pour out his spirit and mighty power to accomplish what seems impossible according to all human planning. What are the ways you can... Okay, let's go to Monday's lesson. The early and latter rain. Oh, boy. Both the Old Testament and New Testament uses the symbolism of water to represent the Holy Spirit. The prophet Isaiah quotes the words of the Lord. I will pour water on him who is thirsty. I will pour my spirit on his descendants. Isaiah 43.3. Isaiah uses the common Hebrew literacy device called parallelism. The second phase in the passage explains the first. The prophet Joel also discusses the symbolism of water. 
God promises to water Israel's fields. Then declares, you, and it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now, you know, when I read these scriptures, I can see why Jesus said over there in Mark 4. If you can't understand the parable of the seed sower, how will you know all parables? And when I say all parables, I'm not just talking about the ones he spoke. I'm talking about every parable in the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Jesus said you can't understand the parables if you don't understand the parable of the seed sower. It's the king of all parables. It's the key to all parables. Very few Christians know about it. You can't understand the parable of the wheat and tares without knowing the uh, the parable of the seed sower in Mark 4, Luke 8, Matthew 13. God promises the water to water Israel fields, then declare, and it shall come to pass afterwards I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Jesus uses the symbolism of water to represent the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something. When God pours out his spirit on all flesh, they're not going to ever again be wheat and tares mingled together. Now, that's what these people who always talk about the latter rain and the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, they never bring that up. God is never going to pour out his spirit on demons in the form of human beings called tares. He's never going to pour out his spirit on foolish virgins. He's never going to pour out his spirit on goats or bad fish. God is never going to do that, y'all. And by them omitting these comparisons, they're basically saying that's exactly what God's going to do. He's going to pour out his spirit on Satan and Satan's children. God is going to pour out his spirit on Judas? Come on, y'all. Why would God do that? Why would God pour out his spirit on Judas? Come on, y'all. We can't be doing stuff like that. How, who are you going to save if you pour out your spirit on Judas? Come on. God is going to pour out his spirit on the wicked angels. Really? I know that these people don't consciously know this type of language I'm speaking, but that's exactly what's being taught undercover. You, whoever's listening to this, just, just for example, say you might be the only Christian in your whole church or your whole conference out of 25,000 people in your church, you might be the only Christian. And the rest of those people in there, the nice ones and the mean ones, are demons. You don't even know it. If you got 100 people in your church, you might be. And I'm not saying you are. You might be the only Christian in there. Not even the pastor. That's how bad things are. If you got 300 people in the church, it might not even be any Christians in there. You know, Jesus said, my wife just mentioned something. Jesus said, uh, which is a good example. I like it. Jesus said to the woman, I forget which woman it was, who she, he cast out the devil. Out of a daughter, I believe. He said, I haven't seen such great faith like this in all of Israel. Wow. Wow. Over a million people, he hadn't seen faith like that. I'm not saying that nobody else had saving faith, but they didn't have the level of faith that that woman had. Now, if it was true about her level of faith, what do you think? 2,000 years, how bad things have gotten. The scripture even says that when Jesus come back, will he find faith? Not to say that, not to say that faith won't be found, but that it's going to be so slim and so rare. It's basically saying, well, can a God, can the God of heaven and earth even find faith when he come back? Woo! Jesus didn't work any miracles 
in his hometown. Why? Why? Because of the level of unbelief. Woo! He couldn't work no military schools in Nazareth. Because of the unbelief, y'all. Isn't that amazing? You around Jesus, you familiar with Jesus, you laugh with Jesus, you play with Jesus. You go to church with Jesus, and guess what? None of y'all got the faith of Jesus. Woo! You don't even know who he is. Wow. What are the two symbols that that each of the following texts regard. Okay, well, let me see here. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Not all flesh that are wheat and tares. All flesh that are wheat only, people. Jesus uses the symbolism of water to represent the Holy Spirit. In John 7, 37 and 39, through 39. In the last days, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Instead, all these denominations are going to Satan and drinking and getting drunk with his wife's wine called Babylon out of her goblet. What are the two symbols that each of the following texts use regarding the outpouring of the Spirit? How are we to understand what they mean? All these. You know, I, hey, y'all, I, I know that this is a hard teaching. I know this ain't the same old fluffy, fluffy, joy, joy, <laughs> Sabbath school class that you're used to. This is like serious Sabbath school on steroids. I, hey, hey, I, I, I'm tired of the fluffy stuff. I want to get down to why all these churches are clones. And all of the clones are arguing that they're the true church. In Bible times, sowing and plowing took place from the middle of October. You know, now this is one thing I'm going to tell you. I do not understand. And I really need to study into it. I need to study into the agricultural year of the Hebrew economy. I really, I would love to understand that. But, you know, my westernized thinking and the way planting is done here is or or my lack thereof it's is skewed so i can so if it's anybody out there that do know i'm willing to sit at your feet and learn maybe you have some insight or you can explain it in a way where i can grasp but everything i'm about to read i don't understand it i don't and i wish i would because i really can see how there is some spiritual parallels and some spiritual meat in due season that is locked up in this lack of understanding that I have of these things that I would really like to learn. So if you, hey, I would listen to you. I don't know if you're right or wrong, but I would like to, if you have some understanding of this, please feel free. Contact me, 815-929-1988. I would love to hear somebody explain this. Really, I would. I would love to sit at someone's feet and listen and hear somebody explain. Somebody who know and everything. But anyway, so I'm just going to read through this. I don't know, y'all. And I should know this. I, I can tell this is something I should know. Because it has a, a it has a lot. It has a great bearing, I can tell, to do with the latter rain, former rain, and outpouring the Holy Ghost. Now, in the biblical context, I know a lot about, well, I won't say a lot, but I know some a, a, a significant amount of things concerning the former rain, latter rain, and the outpouring. But anyway, in Bible times, sowing and, and plowing took place from the middle of October. Okay, so I'm, I'm making a, a middle note of that. Middle of October, shortly after the fall, falling of the early rains. Okay. These early rains brought the seed to germination. Okay, I understand that. And nurtured its early growth. The latter rain came in the latter spring to bring the ripening fruit to the harvest. Okay. The barley harvest and other grains harvest were spring events. Followed 
by the fruit harvest in the summer and fall. I think one of the things that's got me mixed up is because I live in the hemisphere that I live in on, on the globe. And so that's kind of got me mixed around. God used this symbolism of the early, early and latter rain in two ways. The early rain of the spirit fell upon the disciples at Pentecost in order to launch the Christian mission. The latter rain will be poured out on God's church at the end of time in order to complete his mission on earth. The term early rain also refers to the daily work of God's spirit, convicting, instructing, guiding, and empowering each believer. The latter rain is a term used to describe a special endowment of God's Holy Spirit on church, Christ's church just before the set, the coming. Now, I want I want to throw this out to you. Now, I've I've done some extensive study on former rain, latter rain, but I I noticed something. A lot of times when people say latter rain, and this is in, no matter what denomination. When they say latter rain, they always mean outpouring. No, it can't be. So you have three rains, former rain, latter rain, and outpouring. Now, what, now I want to read this over, this one paragraph where it says under the figure. Under the figure of the early and latter rain that falls in eastern lands at seed time, seed time and harvest, the Hebrew prophets foretold the bestowal of the spiritual grace in extraordinary measure upon God's church. The outpouring of the spirit in the days of the apostles was the beginning of the early or former reign. See, when you go to Joel chapter two, it makes a very, 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 very clear distinction between former reign, latter reign, outpouring. It never says that they are the same. But you see how they mixing this up here? They're saying the outer point. See, they don't understand the distinction. There are three types of rains. OK, and apparently, even though they go through some detail, they don't understand the nature of these rains. They really don't. Because they, 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 they're jumbling this stuff all up. But I have a whole video series on former rain, latter rain, outpouring of the Holy Ghost. I think it's called What Is It? Former rain, latter rain, outpouring of the Holy Ghost. What is it? You know. So just look that up. It's it's a it's it's a quite extensive series. Check that out. Um, get get back with me. Hey hey people, don't sit there like you watching television. Give me thumbs up, thumbs down. Give me something. Give me a comment or something. Don't just sit there and like like you watching TV. You know. But anyway, let's be interactive. Don't just be a consumer. You know. Say something. You know, don't act like you're just sitting in some dead Sabbath school class <laughs> or Sunday school class, whatever. But near the close of Earth's harvest, a special bestowal of spiritual grace is promised to prepare the church for the coming of the Son of Man. This outpouring of the Spirit is likened to the falling of the latter rain. See, now, here it says the outpouring is likened to the falling of the latter rain. But look what it says up here early, the, the previous paragraph. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the days of the apostle was the beginning of the early rain. You see what they're saying? The outpouring of the Spirit is the, is the form of the, in one paragraph, is the former rain, and the next one, in the last days, is a, is a, is a, is a form of the latter rain. See, they don't know what the outpouring is. They don't know what the former rain is. They don't know what the uh, latter rain is. And they don't know what the outpouring is. They think that they could just, you know, this is crazy. But anyway, let's go to Tuesday's lesson. The outpouring is a separate and distinct rain all by itself. And, and, and another thing, they never tell you what rain is a symbol of in the Bible. You can study this whole lesson. They're never going to say it. Because first of all, they don't know about the kingdom. And the things that pertain to the kingdom, they really can't grasp. No matter how many theological institution and Bible research um, committee, they don't know. Come on, y'all. They doing the best that they can do in the flesh. And the Bible says all your righteousness is like filthy rags. And that's what this smells like. 
Okay, it says here, uh, let's look at Tuesday's lesson. Requisites for the latter rain. What do the following texts tell us about the preparation needed in order to receive the Holy Spirit's power in its fullness? Acts 1.14. These all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And another thing that you need to take into account, there were living prophets there with them, praying and apostles. Woo! How are you going to highlight the fact that there were women there? Now, you know what I'm saying? How are you going to highlight the fact that there were women there, but there, you're not going to highlight and underscore the fact that there were living apostles and prophets there? Do that make sense? No. Zechariah chapter 10, verse 1. Ask ye the Lord reign in the time of the latter reign. Now watch this now. This is something they don't know in this Sabbath school lesson. And the Adventist church too. And the rest of them too. So the Lord shall make bright clouds. Bright. Bright clouds bring a light rain, y'all. A light rain. Not a heavy rain. Look at this, y'all. The former rain and the latter rain are light rains. The outpouring is a heavy rain. They don't know that. That's why they keep trying to say in some of these paragraphs that the latter rain is the outpouring in the days of the apostle. I mean, the early rain is the out. No, it, the, the early rain can't be a heavy torrential rain. It can't be. So they don't understand the, 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 the nature of the rain. They don't understand it. So it says, ask the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So the Lord shall make bright clouds to give them showers of rain, not an outpouring, a shower to every one grass in the field. There's a scripture, I, well, Deuteronomy chapter 11. Ugh, I got to find that scripture. But it says, oh, I can't remember the scripture. But anyway. Let's go to uh, Acts 4.31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the words of God with boldness. You see that? God is not going to fill any group of people with the Holy Ghost. And there's no living apostles and living Prophets. They're going to have to have more than books. They're going to have to have more than Bibles in their laps in order to get the influence of the whole feeling of the Holy Spirit. Because if that's the case, everybody who got a Bible should have it. You, you see that? This is not based on having a, on owning a book or even memorizing a book. That's what they want to make this. The outpouring of the Holy Ghost is basically a book study. Like at Barnes and Nobles and stuff. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profited nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The scriptures invite us to ask God for the Holy Spirit. Luke eleven thirteen. 13. If you then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? You know who he was talking to, right? In Luke 13, he was talking to the apostles who were also prophets. The disciples believed Christ's promise, waited in, in, waited in unity and prayed for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Hey, y'all, this is more than just about being unified. God wanted all the leaders to be unified. And all the leaders at this time were living apostles and living prophets, not just dead ones, not dead ones at all. They were living. But you, you talk to Seventh-day Adventists, the only prophet they believe in is Ellen G. White. And I want to tell you, I want to tell you this. A lot of Seventh-day Adventists really do put Ellen G. White above the Bible. They really do. 
You can show them something in the Bible and they're going to say what Ellen G. White says about it. You can show them things in the Bible from 10, 100 prophets. And, 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 their, and their final comment is going to be what the Ellen G. White says about it. Now, if you show that many prophets, why is this one prophet greater than all of them? Why is she? She vindicates what they say. Rather than they vindicate what she say. And some people do this on particular issues. The reason that God asks us to pray for the Holy Spirit is not because he is unwilling to give us the spirit, but because we are not prepared to receive it. As we pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, God works in our heart to lead us to deeper repentance. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has never repented of Rwanda. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has never repented of having their, ch of, of, of basically condoning sending your children to public schools. They have never uh, repented of supporting the banking system. Never. They never are going to repent on that. I'm prophesying that right now. Okay. They never going to repent of those things. They never going to repent of being dependent, becoming dependent when they had a chance to be free on big pharma or on the government. They're never going to repent of their 501c3 status. Never, ever. And I'm prophesying that. Never. They're never going to repent of what else? What else do we do? They're never going to repent of the Trinity doctrine. That the Holy Spirit is a third being. They never, ever, ever going to repent of that. You know, when these people were in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, praying and fasting and stuff, I believe what was coming to their mind, all those things that they had been taught by the Pharisees and Sadducees, all those things where they disbelieved Jesus while he was on earth, and they were weeping and repenting. All the false doctrine that was taught by the, 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 the general conference of that day, they were repenting of those things. When have you ever seen Seventh-day Adventists leadership in a general conference session get together and repent and be on one accord. It don't happen, y'all. All they do is brag about what they do. Boast and brag. In the, in the upper room, you don't hear no boasting and bragging about how much, how many devils we made land and sea. Supersized demons we made over land and sea through our evangelistic effort, Adra, and all this kind of stuff. They never going to repent of those things. They never going to. The Seventh Day Adventist Church is just like any other denomination. Never going to repent of installing pastors that are not inspired by God and sanctified. They never going to repent of that. On the day of Pentecost, I believe this is the kind of thing that was going on. We don't know nothing about that. But we're looking for the form of rain. <laughs> I want to tell you, the devil is going to rain on us. The unholy spirit. And when he does, we're going to call it a move of God. Especially when we see that it's attributed with miracles. Oh, could you imagine how powerful Satan is going to be among Adventists if he starts God allows Satan to unleash miracles? <laughs> That's going to be an overwhelming thing. Because most of us are superstitious anyway. As we pray for the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, God works on our heart to lead us to deeper repentance. Praying in small groups with other church members draws us into a closer bond of unity and fellowship. Both prayer and Bible study prepare our minds to be sensitive to the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. 
What is the natural result of spiritual renewal in our lives? Where does all spiritual revival and reformation lead? Acts 4.13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. Notice that what it does not say. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and saw that they were had been members of the Biblical Research Committee of Seventh-day Adventists, they marveled and they took knowledge that they had been at Oakwood <laughs> or Andrews. Ah, don't say that. It says and they had... It says, and they took knowledge that of them that they had been with Jesus. Both prayer and Bible study prepare our minds to be sensitive to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Let's go on. All spiritual revival and genuine reformation leads to a passionate desire to witness. When our hearts are filled with a deep appreciation of everything that Jesus has done for us, then like Peter and John, we can say, we cannot but speak the things which we have heard. Remember, Peter and John are apostles, y'all. So all of us are all apostles, are all prophets. We cannot but speak the things which we have heard. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the early rain. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the early rain on the day of Pentecost empowered the disciples to effectively witness. The outpouring of the the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the early rain. See, I I, I that. See, the outpouring is a whole nother is a, another rain that comes after the early rain. It's the last rain in the agricultural cycle that comes. You have the early rain, the latter rain, the former rain, the latter rain and the outpouring. Their witness was so powerful that. A rebellious mob in Thessalonica screamed in fear that these who have turned the world upside down have got here too. When it says turn the world upside down, that crowd that's speaking this, these people had not been all over the world. They just rocked their world. They couldn't speak for the whole world. That mob of people. Just as the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the day of Pentecost enabled the disciples to, to be a formidable witness to their generation, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the latter reign will empower God's church to reach the world in the final generation. It will, God's church. You know when they say God's church, what they're talking about, right? The Seventh-day Adventist church. They're not talking about Jesus' church. They're talking about the Seventh-day Adventist church. They are not one and the same. It will take nothing less than latter rain power to complete God's mission on earth. And God offers nothing less. Heaven's most precious gift is offered in finite, infinite supply in order to accomplish the most urgent and important task ever entrusted to his church. The early disciples turned the world upside down with their preaching and witness. Why is this? Why isn't that said of us? Well, first of all, the disciples, the early disciples were apostles. They had prophets. They were anointed. You can't find you can't go to any of these denominations and find a body of leaders that are apostles and prophets. That's one thing, let alone anointed. By God. Now, anointed by Satan, yes. They are anointed, but they're just not anointed by God. The baptism of fire. Both the Old and New Testament are a use a variety of symbols such as water, wind, and oil to describe the work of the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist links another image, that of fire, to the work of the Holy Spirit. There are many who have misunderstood John's statement. 
The passage does not say he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit or with fire. It says he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The second exp expression, and with fire, explains the first expression. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the baptism of fire. Hmm. You know, I was thinking about this earlier today. The word baptism in the New Testament is used 80 times. It refers to total immersion. I think that's baptizo. Now, look at this, y'all. When I was thinking about this baptism of fire, I was thinking about the burning bush that was on Mount Sinai or Jabal Musa, whatever you want to call it. And so on this mountain, there was a, 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 a burning bush, but it wasn't consumed. In other words, it wasn't destroyed. It wasn't being burnt. It wasn't deteriorating under the 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 fire in, in while under the fire, the possession of the fire. And so when I when it says baptism of fire, baptism by fire, it looks like when you compare it to that, the baptism of fire is what it does, it doesn't destroy. But actually, it invigorates spiritual life. And you know that in spiritual life is, is being invigorated by one thing. You have to be born again. And after you are born again and you start living that life of a born again person, you start seeking first the kingdom. When you're seeking first the kingdom. Watch this now. This is where the fire comes in. When you're seeking first and only and exclusively the kingdom. I'm going to underscore that till the day I die. When, that's how you know that you are a burning bush. That's how you know you are baptized with fire and have been. You, you follow me? Because see, the bush that was on Mount Moriah or Jabo Musa, uh, Mount Sinai, but that mountain, it was, uh, it was on fire, but it was not being consumed. So that means we would have to conclude that the tree was actually living in the fire. It was living in the anointed fire. It wasn't a strange fire. It was an anointed fire. And the tree was living in it, thriving. The bush was living and thriving in it. And so it is with the believer. How do you know a person has been baptized with fire? Are they living exclusively and only for the upbuilding of God's kingdom? That's how you know that they represent also a burning bush. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? That is so beautiful. The Lord gave me that this morning. So if you're not living exclusively for the purpose of building up God's kingdom, guess what? You're not, you haven't been baptized with fire. You're not living in that fire. Because mm -mm, mm -mm. see that baptism of fire, it keeps burning. It's ongoing. You live in that fire, just like the burning bush was. You actually live in the fire. You grow in that fire. You grow in the enthusiasm of building up God's kingdom in your marriage, in your relationship with your children, your friends, your enemies, your business, the way you handle your finances, your diet, your health, the way you keep your home. You live in that fire. Oh, God. Forgive us. Ooh, that's a big call there. Your sexuality. You live in building up the kingdom in your sexuality. God forgive us. 
The symbolism of fire is a symbol of the glory, presence, and power of God manifested in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water, and God said, let there be light. You see, the Holy Spirit plays an integral role in the building of a God's kingdom. To be baptized with fire is to be immersed in the glory of God's presence through the Holy Spirit in order to witness in his power. Moses met God at the burning bush and then left the glory of his presence in order to witness to Pharaoh. Elijah witnessed. Now I can understand why Moses' face was glowing. Because he was seeking only to deliver Israel. Which were the citizens of God's kingdom. God said, I'm going to let you see my glory. And when you see his face shown, when tongues of fire fell on Pentecost, the disciple witnessed in languages that had never before known. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is immersed in the presence and power of God in order that we can effectively witness of his glory. Now, one of the things that happened with the outpouring of the Holy Ghost you know, it's sad that, you know, you have denominations who said, the only way, the way you know that you really have experienced that baptism of the Holy Ghost, you got to say a whole bunch of stuff that nobody understands, even you. That's that's the that's that's the final evidence that you know you received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You got to say something that nobody knows what you're saying and you don't even know. That's proof that you are really born again. Wow! See what the devil is doing in the Pentecostal churches, assemblies of God, and all these. This is babbling churches. Wow. And based on last Sabbath school quarterly, I think it was week five of the last Sabbath school quarterly, the Seventh-day Adventist church is trying to get into the Pentecostal movement by condoning what happened in what, what was that, 1904 or 1907 with this one guy who they mentioned, I think, in lesson five of last Sabbath school quarterly. They really said seven day Adventists really want to get into that speaking in tongues stuff. They really do. You can read it in their literature. If, if you have spiritual ears to hear and eyes to see, you can you can see they really want to be a part of that. That's why, I, uh, what, not this last uh, general conference session, but the last general conference session before last, they had another fundamental belief called "We believe in the the work of the of the spirit." That was less about believing in the work of the spirit and more about trying to jump on the Pentecostal bandwagon. That's all that was. They want to be accepted by the harlots, the other harlots, so much, the the uh, so much that it's killing them. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is immersion in the presence and power of God in order that we can effectively witness of his glory. Once again, in the last days of Earth's history, God's people will be immersed in his presence, filled with his power and sent out to witness of his glory to the world. The earth will be filled with the glory of God for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea and prophetic visions John saw. An angel messenger descend from heaven and the earth was illuminated with the glory. God's glory, his loving character will be revealed through the power of the Holy Spirit to a waiting world and a watching universe. Every person on planet earth will have the opportunity to both hear and understand God's last day message. God's glory, his loving character will be revealed to the world. How can you, right now, in your own sphere, reveal that glory in your life? What will that require on your part? Thursday's lesson. The great controversy ended. The entire book of Revelation can be summarized in just a few words. Jesus wins. Satan loses. What is the central message of these passages? 
And the dragon was walked with the woman and went to make war, excuse me, with the river of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And uh, these have one mind and shall give their power and strength to the beast. These are they that make war with the lamb and the lamb overcome them. For he is the Lord, the Lord, the King, Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And they that are with him are called chosen and faithful. Here is good news. The same Jesus who defeats Satan on the cross will come again and triumph over the powers of hell. Let me throw this at you. One thing that they love to skip over in the seven day Adventist church, because they don't know nothing about the gospel of the kingdom, really. This is the reason why this is done. And this is why so many are led astray. And that's why so many of the of seven day Adventists, just like other denominations, they're going to come over to the gospel of the kingdom. See, before the controversy ends, God is going to show off with a kingdom to display. Before his second coming of Christ. Yeah, he's going to set up a kingdom and going to show off. He's going to put on an exhibition of how a kingdom can be run. God is going to spit in Satan's face with a kingdom that's going to run and rule the world while sin is still dominating. And this kingdom is going to make exploits. It's going to be a spiritual war like we've never seen before. Now, this is the part of the gospel that None of these major denominations will ever believe that God is literally going to set up a kingdom in Jerusalem. All those fake Jews that's in the Middle East, get out of here. God's going to get rid of all of them. There's actually a prophecy in the Bible that talks about the four carpenters and the four horns that Seventh-day Adventists don't know nothing about. They don't teach on it. They don't know nothing about this prophecy. But it says it's going to get rid of all them fake Jews and all them Palestinians that's vying for that land and that are not converted and don't join the 144,000. They got to go. They got to go. And God's going to set up a kingdom there. And y'all think that place has been turned to a Garden of Eden. It's going to make that place look like a slum. What God is going to do is going to make that place look like a slum. That's filled with vacant lots. It really is. And the greater Israel that God had prophesied to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 is going to be fulfilled before the second coming of Christ. Now, I know, I know, I know none of the denominations, none of the denominations believe this. None of them. Matter of fact, they have said this is another gospel. That's what they're going to say. But this is the gospel that's always been here. Ever since Genesis 3, 15, 16. Genesis 12. This is the gospel, y'all. The gospel of the kingdom dominating the earth while sin is its existence. See, God is going to have to show up sin. And God is going to have to show up the governments of this world by setting up a literal kingdom. That got his own banking system, its own police, own army, own health care system. And the headquarters of this kingdom is going to be in Israel. But guess what? It's going to be spread all over the world like the waters cover the sea. The Bible calls this the restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets. Now, I know I'm in the majority with these prophets that are deceased. I know I'm in the minority. But guess what? The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 36, it will happen. I've said it and I will do it. But anyway, uh, that, that was just a little nugget. I know it's going to get a lot of the people offended. But it's the truth, y'all. Here is good news. The same Jesus who defeats Satan on the cross will come again and triumph over the power. I read that. Until then, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are doing everything possible to reach every person. God's heart aches over the lost world. God's heart aches over a lost church. 
Leia to see her is lost. God never says anything good about Leia to see her. Never. There's some good. And when you talk to these Leia to see her, they always say, there's some good. There's some good. Where's the good that God points out? None. You can't really say there's no good if God don't say there's no good. God says there's good. But anyway, of course, Satan will do everything in his power to oppose this witness. The final crisis will break upon this world and is breaking. And the churches are playing a key role in, in fulfilling Satan's prophecies. Prophetic doom. Jesus will pour out his spirit in latter rain power, but not before Satan pours out his unholy spirit in latter rain power. So that's you got to keep that in mind. If there's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you know that Satan got a counterfeit. And the one that's the counterfeit is the one that these guys have been preaching in this Sabbath school lesson the whole time since Sunday's lesson. Uh, of course, Satan will do everything in his power to oppose this witness. The final crisis will break upon this world. Jesus will pour out his spirit and latter rain power and the work of God on earth will be finished. Servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration will hasten from place to place proclaiming the message of from heaven. So they, they kind of cherry pick some scriptures and this is going to happen. God, they're going to go all over the world and they ain't going to be making people twofold more the child of hell than themselves. They're going to be making people two more fold the child of God than themselves. And they're going to be doing it in the name of Jesus. Miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed. Signs and wonders will follow the believers. The work of God on earth will be finished. Now, if the, sign, if the believer is going to be doing signs and wonders, guess who else is going to be doing signs and wonders? Satan's people, the tares. And inviting his Holy Spirit and makes us into his image. Well, anyway, that's Thursday's lesson. I want to skip over Friday. Let me read this little statement in Friday's lesson from Great Controversy, page 612. The message will be carried not so much by argument as by the deep conviction of the spirit of God. The arguments have been presented. The seed has been sown and now it will spring up and bear fruit. The publications distributed by ministry, missionary workers have exerted their influence. Yet many whose minds were impressed have been prevented from fully comprehending the truth or from yielding obedience. Now the rays of light penetrate everywhere. The truth is seen in its clear clearness and the honest children of God serve the bands which have severed the bands which have held them. Family connection. Listen to this, y'all. This is interesting. I'm glad I read this. Now I remember this now. Now the rays of light penetrate everywhere. The truth. Let me read this whole statement over. The message will be carried not so much by argument as by deep conviction of the spirit of God. The arguments have been presented. The seed has been sown and now it will spring up and bear fruit. So obviously this is after the outpouring. The publications distributed by missionary workers have exerted their influence. So that means that in the kingdom, they're going to have a press. It's going to be a real free press given the message of the kingdom. We don't have that now in any denomination. Yet many whose minds, because the very denominations are the ones that's constricting the truth from coming out. Yet many whose minds are impressed have been prevented from fully comprehending the truth or from yielding obedience. Now the rays of light penetrate everywhere. The truth is seen in its clearness. And the honest children of God sever the bands which have held them to family connection. Denominational relations are powerless to stay them now. Truth is more precious than all beside. Notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, the large number take their stand upon the Lord's side. A large number takes their stand upon the Lord's side. So, this is going to uh, 
turn the hearts of the fathers towards the children and the hearts of the children towards the father that are of the spirit of the kingdom and of the spirit of God. Well, this is Prophet 6, Family Prophets, the angel of the church, the lay of the sins. God bless you, y'all. I just want to say that. And I just want to let you know, y'all, the gospel, what people are calling the gospel, ain't no gospel. All you have to do is look at YouTube. All these guys can talk about, say what the gospel is, but never mention the kingdom. And the ones that do mention the kingdom are still not talking about the kingdom. It's a mask. But anyway, that's it for now. God bless you. Bye-bye. Have a happy Sabbath. Hmm.